Uh, and I'll assume also just for simplicity that's simply lace, so of ADE type. And and we have an irreducible representation, V lambda. And we can study uh, with weight spaces as follows. I'm just fixing some usual notation. And we can study this representation, V lambda, using the geometric Sataki correspondence. So for that purpose, we start with the Langlands dual group. And we consider it's affine Grossmannian, which means we take the points of this Langlands dual group over Laurent series and divide by the points of the Langlands dual group over power series. And these um, co-weights, sorry, these weights mu, so mu, which was above here a weight of the original Lie algebra G, that means it's a co-weight of G check. That means it defines a map from C star into the maximal torus of G check, and therefore defines a point, which I'll denote T to the mu inside this affine Grassmannian. And, and then another piece of notation I'll need is using um, actually only la dominant ones. So if I take lambda to be a dominant as indexing the representations above, then I'll define the orbit uh, through this um, point in the affine Grassmannian of the group G check of power series. And I'll take the closure of that, call that Gerlambda lambda bar, and that's my spherical Schubert variety. Um, Jen? Yeah? Uh, I, I, I have a simple question. So, uh, <coughs> right for, probably for some weights, those T mu in the Grassmannian, they're trivial, and for some, they're non trivial. What for which ones, uh, right? Because you divide by uh, by the tail is by, by the tail is series. Uh, actually, actually, they're always non-trivial. They're never oh. they're never equal to each other. Um, because I mean, this T of the mu never lives inside here. Um, for for example, uh, I mean, it's slightly confusing. Maybe if if G is something like GLN, well, it's technically not allowed because I said it's. Uh, so oh, some, oh, some, it's always and it's, yeah, but even if it's GLN, even if the powers are positive, it won't live in this um, in this thing because the, these matrices has to be invertible over power series. So even if you imagine positive powers of T along the diagonal, it still won't be invertible in in G over power series. Okay. Thanks for the question. Okay. And then, um, okay, where were we? Okay, so we have this affine Grassmannian. It has these spherical Schubert varieties. And um, you should think of this as an analog of the studying the flag variety and its Schubert varieties. And these points T mu, they're like the analog of studying the fixed points of the torus action on the flag variety. And then we have this geometric Satake correspondence which states as follows, that there's an equivalence of categories, in fact, of monoidal categories, between the category of perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian constructible with respect to these orbits, with uh, respect to the stratification given by these orbits, and the representation category of the group G, or the Lie algebra G. And this equivalence takes the uh, IC sheaf of this girl lambda bar to the irreducible representation V lambda. And um, also another important feature is that it, it, there's functors, weight functors from rep G to vector spaces. So it's given by taking a representation to its mu weight space. That's a weight space of the representation. So we call this functor the weight functor. And that matches on the other side by this uh, hyperbolic localization functor, hyperbolic stock functor, defined as follows. You take a sheaf to the following thing. Um, I realize I need to introduce one more piece of notation before I describe this functor. 
So the piece of notation is we let S mu be the orbit of the upper triangular group over Laurent series on the point T mu. And it's going to be important in this talk to think of this not just as an orbit, but also as the attracting set for a C star action. C star. So if we pick a sort of generic C star, dominant C star inside of T check, this um, S mu will be the attracting set for that action. And then I have S, S little mu denotes the inclusion of S mu into this F on this one. And then I can write this functor. So it's the cohomology over S mu of the pullback, shriek pullback of F by the inclusion. So this, this is the theorem, well, of Mirkovich Valonin in this generality that this weight functor matches this hyperbolic stock functor. As a corollary of this theorem, okay, as a corollary of this theorem, we find that the top homology of the intersection between girl M de Bar and S mu is, a, is isomorphic to the mu weight space in D lambda. So we started with our irreducible representation, and now we realize its weight spaces as the top homology of these intersections. And this intersection is typically uh, reducible, has many irreducible components, which are called Mirkovich filament cycles. Okay, so this is sort of old story, but uh, maybe some people have seen it, maybe not. Okay, but now let me get to the point of this talk. Okay, so the point of this talk is that we would like to categorify this. This isomorphism. Um, Joel? Yeah? Uh, I got one more question. So, so how is it this corollary? Uh, just to better understand, is there uh, uh, an analog of this corollary just for the flag variety, right? So just for the Borel value. So, so, right? You, 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 you're looking at the uh, loop group, but what, what if I were looking at the uh, uh, just, just a five dimensional representations, right? Is there such a corollary? And if yes, well, what is it? Mm -hmm. Right? For the great spaces in, uh, oh, in a five oh. dimensional. Uh, I mean, this is very different than Borel V. Well, for a few reasons. One, because there's a there's a passage to the dual group, and an, another reason maybe because there's um, this realizes representations in a topological way uh, as as cohomology of of a like a of a variety of a, like with coefficients in, the, in a constant sheaf rather than as sections of a line bundle, like a coherent cohomology. So it's very different than a borel v kind of realization. Yeah. So, so it's, it's correct that there is no such a thing in the uh, over flag variety for the realize, for realizing the representation in sections of a line bundle, right? Yeah, that, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I mean, it's analogous if you realize your, this is like, um, if you're realizing your representation of section of line bundle, um, you can, uh, all right, let, let me know anything more because I'll probably say something that's not true, but I mean, you can still like understand the, how the, um, I guess a vague analogy would be the relationship between this is like you you can exp, you can think about this BGG um, resolution of your representation in terms of going to the Schubert um, um, in terms of uh, cohomology along the Schubert oh, cell. Yes, but there would so be it's no, kind of vague, vaguely analogous to that. Yeah. Yeah, but but there would be no such a simple formula for Bates spaces, I think. But but okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and as to your, why is it a corollary? Well, I mean, there's like a, the left-hand side here, maybe not completely obviously, is isomorphic to the cohomology over S mu of the shriek pullback of the IC sheet. So, so this, 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 this equality here is needed for this corollary. Okay. So our goal is to ca categorify this isomorphism. 
So what, what, is, what do I mean by that? Or maybe even more precisely, what do I, I want to categorify the left-hand side. So the reason how I'm going to do this, maybe there's different approaches, but this is the approach that I'll be taking today. And we've been working on it for 10 years, uh, is as follows. So we take this variety, Gur lambda bar intersect S mu. And for some reasons, we expect that it will be embedded inside a bigger variety, which is of twice the dimension which will be Poisson. And this guy will be a half dimensional Lagrangian. So we wanna embed it in a bigger thing that's twice the dimension. And moreover, this Poisson variety should, will carry an action of C star. And this left-hand side will be the attracting set for that C star action. So this C star action We'll have a unique fixed point on W lambda mu, and this locus, girl, and this MV locus. Yeah, from, from now on, I'll probably call this thing here the MV locus. This MV locus will be um, the attracting set of that C star action. So we already saw like some trace of that, which as I said, this entire S mu was the attracting set of a C star action. But now I'm like sort of zoning in on this girl lambda bar intersect S mu, and I want that to be the attracting set of a C star action on this this W lambda mu, okay? So why, first I'll return to how, eventually we'll be talking a lot about this definition of this W lambda mu, but before that, let me explain why we would like to do this and how we would lead to this categorification. So if we have this, assuming that we do embed this thing, then we'll, we'll consider a deformation quantization of W lambda mu, which will be Y lambda mu. So non-commutative algebra whose maybe associated graded is isomorphic to the coordinate ring of W lambda mu is a plus one algebra. This quantization will carry a Z grading. This, I mean, this Z grading, Z graded. So this from the fact that there's this C star action. So the C star action um, will lead to this Z grading and uh, then because of the Z grading, we'll study what's called category O for this algebra. This means modules for the algebra such that positively graded part X null potent. So this is analogous with the usual BGG category O for the universal enveloping algebra of a semi-simple D algebra. In fact, for a particular choice of lambda mu, we'll see later, this Y lambda mu will actually be exactly the uh, universal enveloping algebra of SLN. So this is generalizing the usual category O. And then um, because uh, such mod, uh, we're studying this category O, we end up with a, a map from the growth in D group of this category O for Y lambda mu to the top homology. So uh, kind of characteristic cycle map. And in this way, we regard this category O as the, our categorification. So this category O for Y lambda mu, that will be the categorification that we're looking for. And maybe I didn't even really say what did I mean by categorification. So what I mean by categorification is that we'll have this category. So we'll re replace this vector, this representation v lambda mu or this top homology with a category. So this category O, which I'll just write like this for now. And then the linear maps between these weight spaces of the representation coming from the Chevalier generators of our Lie algebra will be replaced by functors between these categories. Okay. And, and similarly, there'll be one in the opposite direction, Fi by a jointness, and together they'll satisfy the Lie algebra relations and even this higher structure of a categorical G action. Okay, so all this is our, our goal.
I mean, this general idea of searching for categorifications goes back to the work of, of Kovanov and has been a popular topic so for the past 20 years. Okay, so to achieve this goal, I need to carry out two things. First, we need to figure out what these um, y lambda mu's over here are, sorry, w lambda mu's and maybe y lambda mu's. We need to find this variety, which is not obvious when it should be. And then we need to construct, well, then find its quantization. And then we need to construct such functors. So that's, that's basically what I'll talk about today. Okay, so there's a simple case in which this y lambda mu is easy to define. And that's what, uh, what like led to this whole idea. So suppose that mu is dominant. Mu is just the weight of the representation. So it doesn't have to be dominant, but let's suppose it is dominant. Then we define W mu to be the orbit of this opposite group G1 T inverse on T mu. By definition, G1 T inverse is the kernel of the map uh, G T inverse. I'm sorry, it should be checked all over. Let me set it up to uh, G given by T uh, goes to infinity. G check. And then I define W lambda mu to be the intersection of Gur lambda bar with W mu. So let me just draw like a little schematic of this. So we have some things we're interested in, these Gur lambda bars. And then these, w, they're finite dimensional and these W mu's are infinite dimensional and they're transverse to the Gur lambda mu. To the girl lambda. You, you need to write intersection and not equal. Uh, ah, you're right. Thank you, Paolo. And so we're taking the intersection of these two transverse things, like, that, like so. Okay. And again, this is the only the definition when mu is dominant. If mu is not dominant, then uh, you can still make this definition, but it won't have the desired properties. And similarly, we can define this y lambda mu as follows. First, we define y mu to be what's called an algebra called a shifted Yangian. It's a subalgebra inside of Grunfeld's Yangian, y. And it quantizes w mu. And then we define w lambda mu to be what's called a truncated shifted Yangian, a certain quotient. Okay, so um, is it so possible this, to ask? Is, is there a, a clean statement of what is W in terms of like you know bundles on P P one? It's yeah. like you know, you've got this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's quite straightforward. So if we can think of the affine Grassmannian as a uh, um, principal G bundles or G check bundles on P one um, trivialized away from infinity, and Saying we're in W mu means the bundle has a certain isomorphism type. Isomorphism types of G check bundles are labeled by dominant coates. Plus, there's an additional condition which relates to this um, harder Narasimhan flag at infinity. That's that's the somehow because of this patent difference between G1 and, and G1 T inverse and G T inverse. Thank you. Um, it is there a good paper to have a look at which uh, explains all of that? You know, sort of basic facts? Uh, um, or uh, not? I um, <laughs> no, I think uh, there's, I, I think it's maybe explained in our work, well, our first paper on this topic. So maybe I should have said right at the beginning, this is all joint work with um, Webster, Weeks, and Jacoby. Uh, some maybe some things are also joint with Peter Zingley, and so we have a or maybe if you look at our first paper on this topic, I think I hope it's it's relatively well explained there. Um, the original definitions of, uh, idea, some of these original ideas goes back to Mirkovich and and were also studied by 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 Sasha and Misha Finkelberg and other and other works. Okay, so. Um, so this brings up the, of course, the natural question is what to do if mu is not dominant.
And then a question people might have been wondering from the very beginning even is what if um, the original Lie algebra G that we started with is not um, a finite type, affine or Kant's Moody type. And both questions one and two are solved using the theory of Coulomb branches. So that's what I'm gonna bring in now. So this is developed by Berberman, Finkelberg and Nakajima, following ideas in the physics literature. Um, I don't know if there's been any talks about this yet at the conference, but well, probably not yet at least. So if, um, if they have the following construction. So suppose that G is any reductive group. So not the G that we have above. I realize it's a little confusing. And later I'm gonna rename the G that I had above, but for now, <laughs> but let me just go for any reductive group here. And think of this G as actually the product of GLNs. That's kind of the most usual G that we'll consider. And V is any representation. And then these guys, they defined a space plus on variety called the Coulomb branch. And it's defined as the spec of some algebra. No, I think you're, you're denoting the representation sometimes by V, sometimes by Ah, v. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I like using V because, you know, and looks really weird as a representation, even though that's a standard terminology. And then I get back to writing N, etc. I'll stick to V, hopefully. Okay, in my notes it's V. So I, I, it's spec of some algebra. That algebra is itself the homology of some space. So I'm going to put some space here, and it, this, it's going to this homology is going to have an algebra structure by a convolution. And the space is the space of maps from a non-separated curve B, which I'll define in a second, called the raviolo curve, to the stack quotient V by G. So this V is the disjoint union of two copies of the formal disk over the punctured disk. So it looks like this, that's the name. And I take maps from that, from that, from that funny curve to the stack V over G, that space of maps, I take its homology uh, for appropriate defined um, sheaf, like the cohomology for an appropriately defined dualizing sheaf. And then that thing will carry an algebra structure. And then we take spec of that. So this, um, this construction, again, it looks a little to totally bizarre, but it's motivated, I guess, by two things. One is studying the homology of the affine Grassmannian of G. This space is closely connected to the affine Grassmannian of G, even though it doesn't maybe appear so. And the second, like, and the second thing it's motivated by, of course, is what I said about physics. And um, okay, so why is it relevant for us? So let's um, let's write G gamma now for the Lie algebra that occurred before. So this is the Lie algebra with Dinkin diagram or maybe I didn't say this before, but so this will be the Lie algebra, ADE, Lie algebra. Uh, actually, sorry, maybe not necessarily ADE, just katz moody Lie algebra. Symmetric katz moody Lie algebra with Lincoln diagram gamma. And as before, um, let's fix lambda and mu. So this would be a dominant weight. This would be any weight. And as if we were building a Nakajima quiver variety from this data, I'll write lambda as a sum wi omega i fundamental weights. And I'll write um, um, lambda minus mu as a sum vi alpha i simple roots. And so this defines me two dimension vectors in n to the i. So this Dinkin diagram gamma is the Dinkin diagram and it has a vertex set i and edges e, although maybe I won't really use this notation. And then um, from this data, as if I'm defining an Akajima quiver variety, I construct a group G, which is a product of the GL of these vi's. 
and it defined a representation, which is a representation space of this quiver. So it'll be the direct sum over edges in the quiver, i goes to j, cp, um, c, v, i, c, v, j, direct sum, um, c, v, i, c, w, i. So that's the v and the g. Then I feed this v and the g into this um, Coulomb branch machine, and out pops a space uh, m, c, g, v. So let's look at some two, two examples. So I'm treating in this talk, I'm not, I don't really want to get too much into this Coulomb branch um, uh, theory. Or, so I, for, we'll think of it more as a kind of black box sort of machine. I'll get a little bit into more details about it later. But for now, let's think of it as kind of a machine which you input a group, a representation, out pops a, a space, the Coulomb branch. So let's do an example. Let's um, really simple example. We'll take G gamma to be SL2, which means the Dinkin diagram is, is trivial, of course. And uh, so we just have the two, this dimension vector will just have a V and a one V and one W. And then the capital V will be hum from CV into CW. So only this second term. And I sort of will depict the quiver like this. In that case. So as a sometimes standard, I'll use circled and squared to denote circled vertices will denote the, the ones where I, uh, of the vector spaces Vs, labeled with Vs, and squared will be the ones denoted Ws, they're the, the framed, vert uh, framed vertices. So this will be my uh, V and W on CV to CW. And it turns out that the corresponding Coulomb branch is a slow to a slice of type um, uh, v w minus v. Uh, at least if, if uh, v is smaller than w over g. A second example is we take uh, g gamma to be SLN, and we take uh, lambda to be n times the first fundamental weight and u to be the zero weight, or all ones weight, if you like. And so in this case, the vector v is one and so on up to n minus one. The vector w is zero and so on up to n. Or maybe n and so on down to zero. Then maybe it's safer to write n minus one. Anyway, up to some switching of n and one and n minus one. Um, and the corresponding quiver looks as follows. So, so this V will be hum C C2, so on hum Cn minus Cn, and then uh, the G will be the product of GL VIs. All right, in this case, GL i is this case. i equals one j n minus one. And in this case, it turns out that the Coulomb branch that produced this way is the nilpotent cone of SLN. Okay, so this is Coulomb branch, the machinery for importing a group, a representation, and outputting a Poisson variety. And again, we're going to use the, the group and representation coming from a, from a framed quiver related to the Dinkin diagram and related to the choice of these uh, dominant weight and weight. So the theorem now of Reverend Finkelberg and Nakajima is for the above choice. So if, if G gamma, say, is of is a ADE type, and uh, mu is dominant. Then, for the above choice of uh, G and V, we get the 
Coulomb branch produced this way is isomorphic to W lambda. So this W lambda mu was defined earlier. So this might seem uh, totally random. Like, <laughs> why should this strange construction uh, reproduce these affine Grassmannian slices? I, I probably should have said this like a long time ago, but these W lambda mu's are called affine Grassmannian slices. Right? And I, way back here, when I defined them, this little bit of the cheese over here, this is this affine Grassmannian slice. Okay, so why should these affine Grassmannian slices arise from this strange Coulomb branch construction? Well, the basic motivation is as follows. Um, there's a general theory called, or maybe a theory is an exaggeration. There's a general principle called symplectic duality, which is supposed to relate pairs of symplectic resolutions or conical symplectic singularities. And this symplectic duality should relate these affine Grassmannian slices with um, Nakajima quiver varieties. <clears throat> which in this case is called, is denoted in MVW. And uh, all, on the other hand, this symplectic duality is also supposed to interchange this Coulomb branch construction with what's called Higgs branch construction, which is much easier to understand mathematically. You just form the cotangent bundle of V and take the Hamiltonian reduction by the action of G. And that's basically, the, in this example, that's the definition of this uh, Nakajima quiver variety. So it's not, from this point of view, this isomorphism of BFN that I just described is like expected. It was expected. Yeah. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So um, again, this was in the case when um, in the case when G gamma is of ADE type and mu is dominant. But what's great about this is that we can now generalize the definition of W lambda mu um, to any. Uh, <laughs> symmetric uh, G gamma and any lambda mu. So uh, G gamma, that's symmetric, that's moving the algebra and any lambda mu or, so lambda is dominant, but mu is any weight. We can define, just define this W lambda mu to be this Coulomb branch. And now, um, if, um, oh, I should say, um, from the, I mentioned before that one of the um, desired properties of WM's mu is that it should have a C star action, and then we'd be interested in setting its attracting set. So from the general principles of Coulomb branch algebra, it's not hard to, it's not hard to build such a C star action. So um, there is a C star action. On W lambda mu. And then we can define W lambda mu plus to be the, the attracting set for that C star action. So this gives us an analog of this MV locus. And I should note that if, um, if G is of AD type, a finite type, And mu is not necessarily dominant, mu is any, then, I mean, a priori, this W on the mu is a new thing. I haven't told you what it is, only in the dominant case, but it admits a sort of relatively simple description, uh, which I won't give. Where rather than using the Affangers mining exactly, it uses more just the group of the Laurent series. The group over the last series. No, I think that if you, if you really want to talk about the cracks and sets, then you need to impose some condition on you because uh, uh, for absolutely arbitrary mu, there will be no fixed points. Okay, well, then the attracting set will be empty. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, if, if there's fixed point set is empty, then by definition, let me say the attracting set is empty. <laughs> yeah. 
if GGAM is, is it okay? I'll say when it is not empty. Yeah, it's a hard question. That's part of it. Well, we'll come to that in a second. <laughs> so if GGAM is a finite type and mu is m is any, then this w and mu can be described using this uh, uh, G gamma over a Laurent series. And using this um, uh, Krilov proof that actually this attracting set does behave as we expect. It's, it's, it, is, it is isomorphic to this MV locus as described here. It's not super obvious, but it's not very hard. Okay, so this motivates the following conjecture of, of Berman, Finkelberg, Nakajima, which they called the geometric Sotake conjecture. So for any symmetric, that's moody the algebra. Um, this topology of the subtracting set is isomorphic to V lambda mu, the weight space, the representation. In particular, as Asher says, part of this conjecture is the statement that this uh, that this locus has a fixed point for the C star action exactly when the weight space is not empty. Well, I'm sure it is written in our paper. I don't think so. <laughs> in this form. Yeah, this is like a pair uh, rephrasing maybe of their conjecture. So, so it's like my, my inter interpretation. It's written in Misha's ICM talk. I don't think it's written in our paper. Well, it is written. I mean, there is a version of this in one of your papers. Yeah. It, it is written in our paper. It is. <laughs> um, so this is a uh, non empty if and only if the representation is not, the weight space is non zero. So that, that's a special, uh, I mean, a special case, but that's sort of like a first, first statement of this. Thing. Okay, so and and so this this conjecture I should say this holds in finite type in finite type so that's by combining together um, what I've said so far including this this isomorphism prelove and the mutual geometric satake and it also holds in affine type A and that's the work of Nakajima. Okay, so what I'm here to talk about today, now I still have some time, I think, um, is um, about this idea of categorification. And for that, we need this quantization. So I mentioned at the, toward the beginning of the talk that we could quantize the original affine Grossmannian slices using these special algebras I called truncated shifted Yangians. And in general, we can also do such quantization in a relatively straightforward way. We just take, um, when we are defining our Coulomb branch, we took the homology of some space, and now I'm just going to take equivariant homology. So I take C star equivariant homology of this mapping space, where C star acts by the, the loop rotation action acting on this disks. And that produces quantizations. So There's a general procedure for quantizing any um, Coulomb branch. In fact, the way to define the Poisson structure on the Coulomb branch is actually to start with this quantization. And so by this philosophy, maybe I should just scroll up to the philosophy back here. So if you recall, the philosophy was as follows. Let's go back to here. So here we started with our MV locus. We wanted to embed it in this Poisson variety, which we now have. Then we want to quantize this Poisson variety, which we now did. So, and then we want to uh, study category O for this quantization. And that's what we're going to do now and construct these functors. Back to the talk. Maybe, maybe, maybe back to an example actually before we proceed. So the example will be to return to this G equals SLN and lambda equals N um, omega N minus one and mu equals zero. And then this algebra A lambda mu is nothing but the universal enveloping algebra of SLN. So very natural algebra. I should give like a little bit of caveat. So when I say this quantification, um, these quantizations come with some parameters. 
And uh, in, this, in this situation, this parameter has manifests itself as the different central quotients of this universal open algebra. Okay, so now let's uh, state our theorem. So, well, this, this is a com combination of a paper which appeared a couple of years ago and a paper which we're working on, which is uh, almost complete. Um, so there's two parts maybe about, so now about this categorification. So there's a categorical. G gamma action. So that means I should construct these functors. So on this category, oh. So that means some functors, uh, EIs, from the category O for one of these algebras. So category O for the next algebra where I change the mu to mu plus alpha i. And this uh, making it into a categorical G action, okay? So in the sense of uh, Povan of Laura and Mukier. And actually, moreover, this um, this categorification, this category O, is actually not just some like random category, but it's actually isomorphic to some sort of like known categorification. So this is what I meant by kind of upgrading this original Mirkovich uh, Bologna kind of isomorphism to a categorical level. So, so this is isomorphic to this say, known categorification by a cyclic atomic TLR algebra. This T lambda mu is what's called cyclotomic TLR. So it's a certain diagrammatically defined algebra, which is cooked up in order to have such a categorical G gamma action. And to be a little bit more precise, the left hand side, as I mentioned, depends on some parameters, which is like this um, uh, central parameter of this USLN. And that's reflected on the right hand side by not working with just this KLR algebra. So the, the cyclotomic KL algebra, but, but rather what's called a, a flavored KLR W algebra. So some algebra which generalizes this thing, which based on work of Ben Webster, and we modified it anyway. So there's some general generalization on the right hand side, which makes this work. So sorry, I'm confused. So, so do you need to make some assumptions on the central character or not for for, for this? No, theory? no, it's, no. I mean, no assumption on the second character just changes what appears on the right hand side. So for any for any central character or for any flavor parameter, I can, we we can tell you exactly what appears on the right hand side. And to get the categorical G action, sorry, I should maybe I should say that. To get the categorical G action, it, the action exists for when the parameters are chosen to be integral. When the flavor parameters are integral, then you get this categorical action. Integral, well, but not necessarily regular in any way, in any sense. Not 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 necessarily regular in any way. In fact, the uh, I mean, in the in the from the viewpoint of this example. You can see that the most singular block is actually the one which corresponds to sort of the EREP, and the general blocks correspond to the tensor product. So, so, so I mean, uh, sometimes this thing categorifies just V lambda mu. But actually, that's, of course, in this case, V lambda mu is just one dimensional, zero weight space of sim n. So, that, that actually corresponds to the like, uh, singular block, most singular block, which is, and this growth in the group has dimension one. And then um, if you put here rather the tensor product, uh, Cn, tensor n, zero weight space, that has size n factorial and that corresponds to the regular. Weight. And so for non integral weights, this functors Ei are just not defined? Um, it, they are defined, but they define you an action of sort of like a, if the weight is completely non integral, of like a bunch of SL2s. And if the weight is like partially non-integral, you get the weight of some Lie algebra, which is like a, who's some Lie algebra whose Dinkin diagram is, is a disjoint union of parts in the Dinkin diagram of the G gamma. Hey, Joe, hi, this is Tudor. Uh, <clears throat> just an elementary question related to what you just said. So it looks like the MV cycle uh, corresponds to a particular object in, in these categories, oh, um, um, yeah. So, so, so reps, yeah. So, do you, do you keep track uh, of what happens to that object? I mean, I think it's unfortunately no. <laughs> I think it's, but it's a good question. So, like, there's a map like this. Is as okay for okay. Let me just write down this map. And Studer says there's a 
there's a map, this characteristic cycle map, which goes like this to this attracting set. Um, so um, this would be um, this in my notation, I guess, uh, W and the U plus this attracting set. And again, this in the, in the um, when it is of, of AD type, this is this MV locus. And, but actually there's a lot of problems. We don't even know, while we know this, uh, that the two sides are uh, abstractly isomorphic, we actually don't know that this map is an isomorphism in general. So it's still an open question to prove that this is an isomorphism, even in the finite dimensional, even the finite type situation. So we don't know this is an isomorphism. And sort of maybe related to that to answer Tudor's question was more about like what's what hits an MV cycle. Um, I mean, typically we wouldn't ex um, we wouldn't expect um, a single MV cycle to have a, an object which which maps to it in general. So not not every MV cycle will have a, a, a preferred sort of object mapping to it. Okay, so this this construction of these functors, which is, um, I guess I'm a little bit running out of time, but I'll, hopefully I'll get to that in a second. Um, this generalizes, so this one, it generalizes maybe, um, well, it maybe generalizes many different sort of constructions, but at least two sort of natural constructions people might have heard of. So one is a Bernstein, a Frankel, Kovana of construction from I don't know, 2000 or something around then. Um, on translation functors. Uh, for for category O, for GLN. And the second thing it maybe generalizes is uh, Bezu Kovnikov. Heading off induction restriction functors. Uh, for Schrodinger algebras. Okay, so let me, in my remaining time, I try to sketch the construction of this EI of functors and so how to define this functor. And the basic idea is using this um, Coulomb branch approach. So let's take um, some GV, like this group and a representation as in our Coulomb construction. And let's fix another piece of data, which is a map from C star into G, or into, or into maybe more naturally into the torus of G. Let's say. Uh, so a co of G. And then I take the levy, which will be the centralizer of the C star. And then I take the invariance for the action of this C star on the representation V. And from this data, well, I'm gonna build a bunch of different algebras using the Coulomb branch construction. So I have my original one, AGV. Then I have, I can use the levy and the original representation. Then I can use the levy and the invariance. The levy will act on the inheritance. And then I can, and then inside the levy, I have the image of this C star, which will act trivially on the invariance. So I can quotient and then still act on the invariance. So four algebras. And um, so we study the relation in general between these four algebras. So the relation as follows. So this first step, um, after applying a certain Morita equivalence, then the, the relation becomes a relation of inclusion. The second step is a ORE localization. So you localize by inverting the monopole operator arc C, for those who know what that means. The third, the third step is, of Hamiltonian, is a Hamiltonian reduction. 
again by the same monopole operator arc C. So in this way, we have a nice functor between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which we're able to study. And why is it relevant for us? So if we choose uh, GV as before, like, I mean, as before in order to construct the, the, the W lambda mu, so G is a product of GLVIs and V is this Hom spaces according to the quiver. And we choose uh, C to be a map, the map from C star into the GLVI, the first fundamental co weight of that GLVI. So just putting a T in the upper left corner of the matrix. Then, well, as before, this is A lambda mu. And this guy, it's not hard to see, is A lambda mu plus alpha i. So we're able to relate the two algebras that we're interested in via this chain. Okay, so uh, do, do I have until 12? What's the timing exactly of this talk? Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm probably going to have uh, a couple of more minutes because I, don't, I think it started a little late. Okay, anyway, probably, probably five minutes is what I need. Okay, so what kind of, I haven't talked so much about this coolant branches and then their modules, so let's, let me talk a little bit about that. So, um, um, inside this Coulomb branch algebra, AGV, there's a very nice subalgebra, commutative subalgebra, which is given by the G equivariant cohomology of a point. So it's a big polynomial ring because G is, has like you know, many different factors. So you have basically some polynomials in different generators. And this algebra we usually call the Galfan Setlin subalgebra. Because when the Coulomb branch algebra is USLN, this is indeed the standard Galfan Setlin subalgebra defined as centers of smaller uh, USLKs. Um, so we're going to be interested in, get, in modules which are locally finite for this Gelfand Settlin subalgebra. So they'll decompose as follows uh, into weight spaces, into generalized weight spaces for this algebra. So this is W mu M is a weight space, and this gamma ranges over spec of this Gelfand Settlin subalgebra, which is just uh, T mod W. So keep in mind this is the T is now the, the torus of G. W the value group of G, so this is spec of and seven about her. Um, and um, yeah, so so this and this this thing is the generalized space, generalized eigenspace. So these modules like this are called Galvin seven modules. And I'll just write for now the GT mod. I mean, I'll just write mod for the model since so it's got the Okay, so theorem is that we have a functor. So using this chain of algebras, study of this chain I described above, we have a functor from Gelfand Settlin modules for A of GB to Gelfand Settlin modules for this LC. Week C. I'll discuss the second, the next step afterwards. And this functor has a is very nicely described in its weight spaces. So such that, so I'll call this functor restriction, let's say. The weight space uh, for the restriction of M is the original weight space. The new is in this T mod W. If um, nu satisfies the property, uh, actually maybe W L or L is the W L is the value group of the Levy LC. If nu satisfies the property of being C negative, so like it's it's a property which is to ensure it is. I mean, it's some complicated definition, but if you subtract a lot of C off from nu, so C is also a weight just like nu is, and if you subtract many a big enough multiple of C, then you get to something which is C negative, as the name sort of implies. 
So in any case, it's, there's a functor and we can very easily control the weight spaces of what's produced by this functor. And then, as I said, and then we have a second functor, which is this Hamiltonian reduction functor. And that we, we can also uh, maybe even simpler to describe what, what it does because it's just, it's, it's a, so this is the Okay, so then if we specialize, to the to the quiver gauge theory. So in other words, the G and V, which produce us our um, our affine Grassmannian slice or generalized affine Grassmannian slice. Then this this produces us or this this restricts to the EI functor we want. So we start here in category O for lambda mu. We apply this restriction functor here. We get actually outside of category O for this, this thingy. But then we can prove that actually after doing the Hamiltonian reduction, this brings you back into category O here. Uh, and defines us defines the EI. OK, great. Um, let me just close the talk then. A couple more minutes. Sasha says I have a couple more minutes of asking sort of questions. So like question one is would be like, what is the geometry behind this procedure? I mean, we just did this because it's something that worked. <laughs> but it's not totally clear what, if, if you think about what this, this mess here is, this process is quantizing. These spaces along the way are a little weird. So it's not very clear what the geometry behind this really is. And, uh, and, and how does it relate? Well, and your definition uh, is done sort of using what? I'm saying that it's not geometric, but how, what, what do you use to, to, to define this one? Right here, right here, right here. I just, I mean, well, I didn't write it down to the definition, but I used the fact that these relations between these algebras. Well, but you said that there is a restriction functor. You didn't say anything about it. Oh, well, the, the, it's not complicated. The first, first you apply the meridian equivalence to the module, then the inclusion gives you a functor, and then you invert, you apply this inverting arc C. So it just like follows the chain of the things that are described here, just on the level of module. And um, so how does it relate with the geometric, usual geometric sutake? And, and sort of, we can sort of say a little bit partial progress uh, towards this, which is going to appear in an, yet another paper, I think, which is you now we can prove that this is compatible with tensor products um, in the way that the, uh, is supposed to be done, like in a way which the, the um, this geometric Sutake conjecture is supposed to be compatible with tensor products. So this, this is a, um, a sort of point in favor of this construction. And uh, I don't know what question two was supposed to be. I guess that's all. Okay, I'll stop there. I guess my question two was supposed to be is to prove that this, um, um, is this CC map an isomorphism? So if we could prove that that CC map was an isomorphism or uh, maybe the left hand side needs to be like appropriately modified, but with appropriately modified left hand side, CC map, and go back here, this is after, right here. Um, then, of course, we could use this method to prove the, the conjecture of the FN. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Joel. Ask if there are any questions from the online audience. Okay, then any questions from the offline audience? I actually have a question. So uh, 
the question is this that somehow so you mentioned symplectic duality and of course there's this categorical symplectic duality which is to say that this uh, category o for the coulomb branch is uh, well not the coulomb but the kind of casual dual to the corresponding uh, category for the higgs branch which, you know at the first glance I mean, it's not equivalence, but uh, but it's, it's something like an equivalence. So the question is, could you, from the very beginning, work with the Higgs branch, not with the Coulomb branch? I mean, I mean, in some sense, um, that's kind of closely related to this, like I don't know, second step here. So this um, to prove the um, this causal duality in this example you know, for these uh, generally Gaussmannian slices. It actually is pretty much the same as proving this this equivalence right here, because it's already known how to relate these KLR algebras or whatever quotients of KLR algebras to quiver varieties. One definition of this thing is is a is an X between some uh, perverse sheaves on there. So, so so to answer your question, I mean, yeah, yes, you could you could do that equivalence, then construct the functor. Um, but now we wanted a definition of these functors EI, which was sort of internal to the to the Coulomb branch side. Well, that, that, that's precisely my question. So, how would you make them internal to the Higgs branch side? Yeah, that was already done, I guess. By uh, that's that's way easier uh, to make it to do it on the Higgs branch side is way easier because you just quantize the usual usual Nakajima correspondences and use them to define functors okay uh, but but then so that um, was done by ben ben wrote that down in, 10 years ago almost but but effectively yeah. it's like was originally in the i mean already in like the you know, some traces of it are go back to you know, rookie's work and also kubana blauda and, and I, I, I understand yeah but my, my question i'm a little bit confused about what what did you gain by uh, working with the Coulomb branch? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe what what you gain is this characteristic cycle map, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's just interesting to understand how this categorical action can arise from the Coulomb branch side. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, hi. Uh, I want to ask, uh, like, my general question, which doesn't have a good answer. So uh, here you are considering uh, categories of representations over complex numbers, uh, and is it possible to say something if we are considering these algebras over? fields of characteristics p and consider representations over fields of positive characteristics it's definitely possible um uh, in fact i haven't i haven't worked much on it but ben ben webster wrote um a paper when he's where he studied uh, represent like modules for coulomb branch algebras and positive characteristics uh, again using so so i mean not not as much not as much about this but 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 it's sort of but this this thing I should get rid of that one. yeah this one um study he did he studied aspect of that in positive characteristics so it has been I see. Mm -hmm. um, but presumably the key group becomes different right yeah i don't know off the top of my head exactly the results but yeah I mean, maybe I should say like the nature of the results is to relate the study of these modules, these algebras to this diagrammatic side. Okay, any more questions? Then let's find Joel again.